the research. That's what the Intersol Power Corporation is currently contracted with Johnson Engineering of Boulder, Colorado to develop and test Tesla turbines. So this is some very practical work coming up from Seth Bonney. And um, so his title is Current Tesla Turbine Technology. Let's welcome Seth Bonney. Okay, so free tie clip. Why are me up here? Yep. Thank you. Okay, and yeah, watch those two. Yeah, gotcha, thank you. <laughs> thank you. He called it a powerhouse in a hat, the small 10 inch diameter version developed 110 horsepower at 5,000 RPM. In 1906, successful testing of a 10-pound turbine developing 30 horsepower convinced Tesla to order a new stationary with a letterhead and en envelopes entitled 20 horsepower per pound as an attainable goal. What I have done, said Tesla, is to discard entirely the idea that there must be a solid wall in front of the steam and to apply in a practical way for the first time, two properties which every physicist knows to be common to all fluids, but which have not been utilized. These are adhesion and viscosity. Owing to these, a body propelled through such a medium encounters a peculiar impediment known as lateral or skin resistance, which is twofold. One arising from the shock of the fluid against the asperities of the solid substance, the other from internal forces opposing molecular separation. As an inevitable consequence, a certain amount of the fluid is dragged along by the moving body. Conversely, if the body be placed in a fluid motion, for the same reasons, it is impelled in the direction of movement. If we refer to the drawings illustrated here, we see that the introduction of a fluid or a gas into the casing strikes these parallel disks tangentially and flows between them on a natural spiral path towards the center exhaust openings. This will be the illustration on the far right here. The propelling fluid moves in a natural path or spiral streamlines of least resistance, avoiding losses due to sudden variations while the fluid imparts its energy. We who are stuck with a piston engine know all too well that the use of pistons, paddles, vanes, and blades unnecessarily introduces numerous defects and limitations and adds to the complication, cost of production, and maintenance of the machines. Describing Tesla's high-pressure steam turbine, Mr. Zaychek in his Scientific American article of September 1911 states that the turbine has a rotor which consists of 25 flat steel disks, 1 32nd of an inch in thickness of hardened and carefully tempered steel spaced 1 16th of an inch apart. The rotor as assembled is 3 half inches wide on the face by 18 inches in diameter. As the disks commence to rotate and their speed increases, the stream travels in spiral paths, the length of which increases until the particles of the fluid complete a number of turns around the shaft before reaching the exhaust, covering in the meantime a linear path of some 12 to 16 feet in length. During its progress from inlet to exhaust, the velocity and pressure of the steam are reduced until it leaves the exhaust at one or two pounds gauge pressure. It should be noted that although the experimental plant at the Waterside Station develops 200 horsepower with 125 pounds at the supply pipe and free exhaust, it could show an output of 300 horsepower with the full pressure of the Edison supply circuit. Furthermore, Mr. Tesla states that if it were compounded and the exhaust were led to a low pressure unit carrying about three times the number of disks contained in the high pressure element, with connection to a condenser affording 28 and a half to 29 inches of vacuum, the results obtained in the present high pressure machine indicates that the compound unit would give an output of 600 horsepower without great increase in dimensions. This estimate is conservative. 
Tesla himself states that the torque is directly proportional to the square of the velocity of the fluid relatively to the runner and to the effective area of, effective area of the disks and inversely to the distance separating them. The machine will generally perform its maximum work when the effective speed of the runner is one half of that of the fluid. But to attain the highest economy, the relative speed or slip for any given performance should be as small as possible. This condition may be to any desired degree approximated by increasing the active area and reducing the space between the disks. The design of, the, of Tesla's steam turbine also permits this engine to recover energy that would otherwise be lost in a conventional bladed turbine. The latent heat of vaporization, or the energy released during the, state, the change of state from a gas to a liquid, is recoverable with the bladeless turbine. This latent or stored energy is released when the steam condenses and changes back into liquid water. In the bladeless steam turbine, steam can go through a phased state change, condensing back into water inside the turbine, thereby capturing this tremendous potential energy. This would destroy a bladed type turbine, which can tolerate no water, and uses a separate condenser outside the turbine, thereby throwing this energy off as waste heat. This extra energy is made available from the stored latent energy released from the steam as it phase changes back into water inside the turbine. This results in a total power increase of 20, or a reduction of the fuel consumption by th the same amount. The same properties of adhesion and viscosity serve to make the encased disks function as a pump when power is applied to the shaft. The fluid or gas now enters the chamber through the central openings and is dragged along in the direction of rotation and propelled outward by centrifugal force in a helical path towards the outlet. This occurs due to the molecular attraction of the fluid or gas to the surface of the disks. This creates a boundary layer of the medium on the disks and imparts energy to the fluid around it, increasing its velocity. When the fluid reaches the outlet, the kinetic energy is traded for static pressure. There is no static pressure internally, which allows for light casings and minimal wear on seals. Due to the boundary layer of boundary layer of the fluid adhering to the disks, there is no impact on the disks, and subsequently virtually no erosion of the surfaces, even when solid matter passes through with the fluid. Another prime benefit of this pump is that because there are no lifting surfaces, cavitation, which can easily destroy conventional pumps, does not exist with this design. Tesla had foreseen the use of the turbine design as a motive force behind his flying machine a craft that would have, quote, neither wings nor propellers, an engine sufficiently light and powerful to operate the ideal flying machine. But his inability to work with people and their inability to understand the concept fully created enormous problems. He finally persuaded the Alice Chalmers Manufacturing Company in Milwaukee to build three turbines. But again, he was most undiplomatic with both engineering staff and management and communi communicated his dissatisfaction to the board of directors. He walked out on tests after learning of a negative report by the engineers, claiming they would not build it as he wished. They said he refused to supply enough information. They complained that his designs were only in his head and they couldn't work from theory. Tesla, on the other hand, felt they should have been able to do this if they were qualified engineers. <laughs> He gave no margin for human frailty or lack of engineering imagination. In turn, they were unable to discount the behavior of, his, of genius. The result was the usual stalemate. Tesla threw up his hands and left before important tests were completed. With the onset of World War I and the firm entrenchment of the internal combustion engine, Tesla's turbine virtually disappeared from sight and many decades were to pass before renewed interest began to resurrect the possibilities of this elegantly simple invention. Except for two master's theses in the 1950s, it wasn't until the early 60s that research was undertaken on several fronts, attempting to reintroduce the concept of boundary layer techniques for turbines and pumps. In 1962, S. H. Hazinger and L. G. Kurt, task scientists for the U.S. Air Force, conducted research at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and published a paper entitled Investigations of a Shear Force Pump. One of the primary conclusions was that 
and I quote, the flow conditions between the shear surfaces of an efficient shear force rotor are, in general, laminar. Since laminar flow is very accessible to analytical treatment, fairly well-rounded performance predictions for the common size shear force rotor are possible, unquote. This would turn out to be the basis of future investigations, leading scientists and engineers to seek confirmation in mathematical models, which would prove the theory before proceeding with the actual development. Dr. Warren Rice, professor of mechanical engineering specializing in fluid dynamics at Arizona State University, published several papers between 1963 and 1979 dealing with flow analysis between co-rotating disks. Along with Professor D. F. Jankowski and graduate researcher C. R. Truman, they presented papers calculating the efficiencies of laminar flow between the disks of the turbine using both compressible and incompressible fluids. In one of their later publications, entitled Laminar Flow, well, Laminar Through Flow of a Fluid Containing Particles Between Co-Rotating Discs, it is stated in the results that, and I quote, analysis using local equations for turbulent flow is clearly needed to fully explore the applicability of multiple disc turbo machinery with fluid particles or vapor droplet flows. Describing events using equations for the single type of flow led to disappointing results. While the empirical evidence of Tesla's early machines clearly indicated the efficiencies of his inventions. Calculations for turbulent flow are extremely complex and it has not been until recently that this type of flow regime could be described mathematically and then only with the help of sophisticated supercomputers. Now we're finding computer programs that can describe the effects and efficiencies of turbulent flow and can generate design parameters of other important factors such as disc, disc thicknesses and spacing for specific fluids and applications. This is basically what we just heard Lynn Sargella talk about in the fractal analysis. During the same time period, practical uses for the boundary layer pumps and turbines were developed and used without relying entirely on mathematical confirmation of the theory. In his address to this symposium in 1986, Jake Possell, a mechanical engineer with extensive turbine experience and 25 years of research on Tesla turbines to his credit, explained the use of this technology in an electrical generating unit used by the US Navy during the Korean War. It was the beginning of construction of actual machines for particular applications, starting with turbines, moving on to pumps, and most recently back to turbines again. Purcell has several patents for both turbines and pumps, although his company, American Development and Manufacturing, has concentrated mainly on pumps based on the boundary, boundary layer principle. Established as the pioneer and leader in the field of boundary layer pumps, Purcell, along with Jim and Norm Gabler, offer equipment of all types for all types of media, from low decibel air movers to concrete pumps to powered rotors capable of pumping two or three-phase flow. In 1980, Mr. Possell was granted a patent for geothermal turbines using this bladeless technology. Geothermal power plants using bladeless turbines have been field tested, proving that this design can utilize the total effluent, steam, hot water, and solid particles, for a 60% increase in efficiency over any system using steam brine or binary cycle heat exchangers. He's developed pumps designed for nuclear power plants that can pump boiling water, avoiding coolant flow failure, similar to what happened at Three Mile Island and in Chernobyl. Mr. Possell has also produced prototype fuel-fired combustion turbines based on principles utilized in his early model military generator. The bladeless turbine electrical generator uses the compressor, burner can igniter, and turbine combination to produce 30,000 watts output in a compact, lightweight unit. A reduction gearbox connects the turbine and compressor stages to the electrical generator. Other research and development has produced a prototype bladeless turbojet engine with a 600 pound thrust capability. The bladeless compressor and turbine are connected by the same shaft while the burner can is mounted externally. The turbojet, the prototype turbojet, 
operates at 35,000 RPM using water-cooled bearings. Extensive testing has been undertaken to achieve an efficient nozzle design to direct the flow of the ignited fuel onto the discs of these turbines. And of course now Jake has a updated model which he is uh, circulating with a flyer that I'm sure you can pick up uh, after this talk. Examples of the types of pumps and turbines are documented and illustrated in a new publication compiled by Jeffrey Hayes, editor of the Tesla Society's Journal of Power and Resonance, entitled Boundary Layer Breakthrough. This book is the most complete publication on the subject of Tesla turbine technology to date, and by the way is available in the Hyogene bookstore. It is highly recommended for anyone wishing to read a comprehensive overview on the subject and details the various pumps and applications that Mr. Possell has produced. I'd like to conclude this afternoon with a short quote from the visionary R. Buckminster Fuller. He says, quote, there isn't any energy crisis. It's simply a crisis of ignorance. Here we have before us the potential for tremendous advancement, not just technologically, because this information has been with us, yet remained dormant for almost a century, but for the benefit of all life on this planet. Pollution-free automobiles and aircraft, clean fuel elect electrical generating plants, super efficient geothermal power plants, free on free air conditioning, all of these are within our grasp if we take the bold step to apply the knowledge that we have here available to us. We don't need new technology to solve the crises afflicting our world. It is and has been with us all along. Tesla foresaw many of the problems we encounter today, and 60 years before modern man turned to science for answers, he said, today scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. Where would we be if we could have had 80 or 90 years of research and development on Tesla's bladed turbine instead of on the internal combustion piston engine? We can see that we have gone about as far as we can with the conventional technology. And I propose that we re-educate ourselves by uncovering and cultivating the lessons from the past so that we may henceforth go wisely into the future. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Question? Tell us something about the surfacing. Uh, need these be very smooth surfaces on these blades, as smooth as possible? They really don't. There is uh, no appreciable decrease in efficiency if the, bl if the surfaces of these discs are rough or smooth. It doesn't matter. They actually, there is very little difference. So that the discs may degrade uh, slightly during, a, say for example, a pumping regime of very corrosive fluid and it uh, only minimally affects the, the efficiency of the pump. Yeah? Made one out of plexiglass? Out of plexiglass? Uh, not that I know of, but it's with the simplicity of construction, it certainly could be done. Have any power versus RPM curve? Where does it leak in power? Uh, there is an efficiency window uh, in most of these units, but you'll have to ask uh, Mr. Possell for the critical data on that. Any other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>